life is always going to be difficult, but there's not a lot of reasons not to be kind. Everyone can have their bad days, but being kind is the more more of a holistic thing. It goes past the moment. Welcome to Flip Your Script, the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. When you think of Harvard Law, what do you think of? Who attends there? You probably think straight A's, prestigious family, world-class debaters. Well, that's what I thought until I heard Rahan Staten's story. He went from collecting trash and not getting accepted into any colleges he applied to to being a Harvard Law student. Welcome to the Flip Your Script podcast. It's great to have you. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, It's really great being here. And you're just moving into Cambridge to attend school. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Um, You know, last semester, last year was really hard. You know, we did the whole virtual environment. I was also a caregiver full time for my father. So balancing the caregiving and balancing the 1L was really, uh, it was a lot to take in. Is it hard for you to be around people your age who have had a fairly easy life? And I don't mean every, everyone has struggles, of course, but who have had a fairly simple path to college. And then for you to be taking the path that you took, which we'll get into, caring for your dad, having the, some of these family struggles and burdens that you've had. Do you ever say to those people like, really? Or are you, are you more kind and gentle than that? Well, you know, I try myself, I try my best to take myself out of my own body. So just to say, to say, I, I, I wouldn't say it's hard. I really think the key is, you know, people can only deal with what life presented to them. So whatever is hard to them, you know, I try my best never to try to invalidate their experiences. Now, maybe sometimes I'll add to the perspective from mine if it's asked, but typically, you know, I just try to meet people with where they're at. And your story is so, I suspect, unusual from other people that you're meeting there because your path to college wasn't a straight one. Your path to Harvard was riddled with denials and hard work and other people who had to advocate on your behalf. So let's go back to your childhood. Your childhood also wasn't a simple and easy and fairy tale sort of childhood. Talk about your family. So, you know, I'll say up until the age of eight, I was a really privileged kid. I could have really, I was doing well in school, two car household, you know, normal by all. And quite frankly, I was probably a little spoiled too. Saying that to say though, after eight, you know, my mom actually just abandoned the family. You know, I think she had another husband or a boyfriend back in Sri Lanka. I'm by the way, I'm half African American, half Sri Lankan. And so after she left, you know, things kind of went downhill. My dad got laid off. You know, the privilege life that I knew was no more, not at all. And quite frankly, it was the complete opposite of it. And we went from food insecurities, housing insecurities. I mean, there was even a time where I didn't do well on a test because it was winter. We didn't have heat. And I came to, came to class to seventh grade. I did bad on a test. Then the teacher tried to put me in special education. So saying that to say, it was one battle after another. And it's pretty hard to keep your head in school and on tests and the ability to study when you're hungry and cold and not sure what you're going to walk it home to that day. 100%. And I guess it's even more harder when you're kind of walking in front of all of these people. And, you know, you're a kid and you're in pain, you're sad, and uh, you don't even feel safe because, you know, you're always one day away from losing your house. You're always one day away from your dad getting I don't know, maybe something went wrong at work and he got fired and now there's nothing we can do. And, you know, people just, you know, it's not, again, I'm going around telling people all this, but you just feel so invisible. And that's a battle within itself. It's a really important point because I think for people who have never been invisible, it's a hard thing to think about. And even to have teachers invalidate not just your experience, but your intellect. Definitely. That was hard. And And you must at some point, I suspect, then question yourself, like, is something wrong with me? Is it me? Is 
even though you had the capability and capacity and IQ to be able to ace that test likely. You know, the thing is, I'll actually say this. I don't think I necessarily bought into the hype of me not being capable. However, I built up a strong animosity towards the school system where I just didn't want to be a part of it. As in like, it's like, you know, you say these mean things to me, my life already sucks, at least from my perspective. And now you're kicking me while I'm down. It's like, I don't want to be you. I don't want to be like you. I don't even want to be near you. And uh, I was really good at sports. I was a really good martial artist. Like I won national titles across the country, despite my home circumstances. And so I told myself, you know, I don't want to be in school. I don't like you. I don't like you teachers. So I'm going to use this other route to get out of here since it's not safe for me in school. And there wasn't a teacher who made you think differently about the whole system. You felt broadly that you were invisible and that they weren't understanding who you were or giving you opportunity. Is that a fair assessment? It's almost fair. I will say this. There was one teacher there and she was really, really kind to me. And she didn't necessarily talk to me about like doing well in school. She really just talked to me about surviving and doing what I can. And so she didn't make me feel invisible, but everyone else did. So like, and then I, and I can always say I was grateful for that. Right. Cause even with that extra boost of motivation, she made my days easier. So almost everyone. And that's, I think something that all of us, everybody listening can take heart to is that if you see that kid, adult, whoever it might be that has something is different, it's so easy to look away. And what that person needs probably is to be looked at and to be seen and to have a conversation with them because they want to be seen, valued, and heard like everyone else. Definitely. So you go through high school, you, you have these struggles, and yet you stay in school when you could have at some point just walked out and gotten a job. Definitely. I mean, you know, these are the things where it's like, I see my dad a little bit, meaning that he's a great father, but he's always working to provide. So when there was like times he was working one job, two jobs, three jobs. And so... The reality is, I didn't think I was going to go to college per se, but I what I did tell myself I'm not going to like fail out uh, because my thing is if my dad's working this hard, the least I can do is make his life less stressful as I can and just attempt to get through this thing. Now, mind you, I didn't do always do a good job at that, but I definitely didn't want to fail. I just hated being there because it hurt me. And so much of the press around your story and the way it's been shared is about from trash collector to Harvard Law. So how did the transition from high school to working sanitation, what was that path? So essentially, I have this shoulder injury in 2014. I mean, literally everyone thought I was going to become a pro fighter. And even my teachers, the one thing I even say about in high school, my teachers all said, oh, don't forget us when you turn pro. Like, you're going to be the greatest. Literally, like, you know, I'll even say my teachers may have not respected me from an academic sense, but everyone respected me from, like, the athletic sense. And everyone, because, again, people saw me winning national trophies every year. So in 2014, I have a double shoulder injury, and that's that. That's, That's how that ends. So I ended up applying to a couple, you know, universities. And quite frankly, they're all very low ranked. So not even high university, but not one took me. And in addition, I got a 1040 out of 2400 on my SAT. And that's horrible. So literally no one took me. And I basically say, all right, if I can't go to school, I'll go and help my dad earn some money. And so I went to go work as a sanitation worker. Was that hard for you to, I I mean, of course it was hard for you. That's a silly question. Your dreams are shattered and you feel like you have no option except for this one option. How did you not get so angry that you became better? Well, I'll even say this. I kind of used it as a chip on my shoulder because I, to be honest with you, I was bitter, but I guess there's, you ever heard that quote about fear? It's kind of like, you know, some people respond to fear by running. Some people respond to fear by fighting. And I was bitter. I was angry. I was sad. I mean, I was probably depressed before I even knew what it really meant to be depressed. But at the end of the day, I had a role model in my father. And I said, I have to, I can't just let, this is not how the story ends. Because I wanted to give him a better life for all the sacrifices he gave to me. So when I ended up going to the sanitation company, I was lucky and fortunate. One, because I was surrounded by 
100% of people who were ex felons. They were all formally incarcerated. If they were a trash hauler, they were formally incarcerated. It's a funny stat, but it's true. I mean, at least for where I was at. And for some reason, I don't know what they saw in me, but for some reason, they thought I was the smartest thing since sliced bread or something. I don't know. Like, they just thought I was really brilliant. And they said, you got to go to school. You could, you could go do something, but the, come back here if it doesn't work out, but you still have a lot of fight left in you. Go do something. After a month of hearing that every day, I eventually bought into the hype and they connected me to someone at Bowie State. He took me under his wing. He gave me a community. And that's when I started getting 4.0s. Like my grades really shifted just that quickly. And mind you, a lot of work went into that. But it literally just like I said, uh, I graduated high school towards the bottom of my class. I go to college after, you know, going to the sanitation company. And then all of a sudden I start getting really, really, really good grades. There are a lot of fantastic teachers in the world. And what amazes me about that part of your story is that the sanitation workers gave you more faith and hope in your brains than people who went to college and maybe have masters and are paid to be in the education space. That is sad, remarkable, and inspiring all at the same time. Definitely. I mean, I always thought I was bittersweet. You know, it's it's funny because this there's like the there's like a big lie that goes around that says sanitation workers get paid a lot of money. It's like the biggest lie. And I don't know who started it. I mean, I know people I know like sanitation workers in New York make a lot of money relative to the rest of the country. But they got to live in New York. New York isn't a cheap place to live. <laughs> exactly. Right. It's not a cheap place to live. But um, like I said, like there were people making less than forty thousand dollars. People like, and I guess probably the average is probably around like the like mid 40s to maybe like upper 40s. But the reality is a lot of us at the sanitation, you know, at the job, you know, our bodies are breaking down. We're not getting paid a lot. And so to me, it was kind of funny. Like when my story broke out, people were saying, ah, well, it couldn't have been that bad because sanitation workers make a lot of money. And, you know, they're talking about the um, my coworkers as well. It's like, well, yeah, well, maybe they're able to do that because they made a lot of money, so it just might have not been that bad. But I was like, I don't understand like how that is fitting into this narrative, because that's just like not true. And I can I don't think I've ever actually openly said that anywhere before. The biggest part of this whole thing that bothered me was this notion of sanitation workers make a lot of money kept coming up. And I was like, who told you that? That is so strange, actually, because the only people that have motivation to be out there saying sanitation workers make a lot of money are sanitation companies who need to hire people and make them think that this is like the, this is where you want to spend your life. Cause you know, I mean, and, and the reality is I don't think people realize, well, there's a difference between being like a driver of a truck and just being a trash hauler or even being an industrial painter who focuses on cleaning up the dumpsters. Like there are so many different roles. And so I guess my question then becomes when someone says sanitation worker, do you think of everyone or are you only thinking about a driver? Are you only thinking about upper management? So anyways, just th that's just way of saying that was always like a pet peeve to me. So what part of the, in the sanitation world, what did, did you were just like, literally you weren't driving, you were literally going around and, and picking up people's garbage, right? So for actually, for the most part, my job was cleaning up dumpsters. Like my job was really like, there was a disgusting dumpster that was broken down. My job is to clean it up and fix it, which is disgusting. You know, I trash hold some days whenever they needed extra help and, uh, and then even recycling some days. But my primary job was actually cleaning and refurbishing disgusting dumpsters. So I hope no one is eating as I ask this next question, but I'm, you know, I'm fascinated. And it's a podcast, so we can ask questions yeah. off topic. What's the grossest thing you found in a dumpster? I'll say I'm going to answer you like two questions. One, one that I'll say the most interesting thing I ever found in a dumpster was a grenade. That was crazy. A live grenade? It wasn't live. But you didn't know that, of course. I didn't know. Right? I yeah. didn't know. We had to call safety to come help that out. You know, get that. It, actually, to be fair, more specifically, it was a flashbang. Uh, that but, type of like, you know, makes everything, you know, hurts your senses and whatnot. And then. The, cra the most like disgusting thing I kind of saw was like a bed of roaches. Like, cause it's one thing to see like roaches in general, but it's like weird to see like, like probably like hundreds to maybe thousands just like crawling on each other left and right in this like weird pit 
a roach, you know, <laughs> I don't oh. know. Say. That, that, that was just like, that was just, I've never seen that. I, that And that wasn't a common thing. Cause like you said, you're used to seeing roaches, but you're not used to seeing a bed of them. See, I have like an Indiana Jones picture, like Indiana Jones is going to, you know, standing in that because I think the only time I've ever seen that kind of thing is like in a movie. Definitely. Okay. Sorry. I had to ask because that's one of those jobs where you see some really interesting things and you don't know what tomorrow will bring in, 100%. in the dumpster. 100%. So you're doing this job. You have these people around you who are saying, you know what? you can do more. We, we can't do more. We're felons. And this is probably all that life will have in store for us. But you get out, go do more, and we're going to help you. So not only did they just like plant positive seeds in your head, which is really important, but they actually hooked you up with someone to help you. You had advocates around you and it happened fast. I mean, you said it was a month. It isn't like these people knew you for 10 years. Oh. They saw something, they used their words, they took action and you got out. Yep. Just like that. Does that make you think differently about how you, when you're done with school, are going to help others or give back? Well, quite frankly, um, no, but not for like an obvious reason. So, you know, I grew up in a very, like in a very, 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 uh, again, it just wasn't pretty. That's all I can say. It just wasn't pretty. I'm not saying I had it the worst, but it just wasn't pretty. Saying that to say, despite all the issues we went through, my dad was the most giving dude I knew. Like, Whenever somebody needed like shelter, again, it might have not have been the best shelter, but never charged anybody anything. There were some people stayed with us more than two years, you know, but if you needed something, he will help you with anything that he, any way that he could. And that's why I even say when it comes to like kindness and when people are telling me their perspective of anything, again, I might add in my two cents sometimes, but really I just try to meet people where they're at because that's how my dad always acted. So saying that to say, even when I was in a really, really bad situation um, in 2019, I didn't really talk about this in my story. After I graduated in 2018, I was the commencement speaker. I got super, super sick. Even though like we were about to lose the house, I couldn't really do any real job at the time because I was so sick. And I was sick for over like six months. I was still tutoring people for free for the LSAT. And I never once charged for LSAT services because my whole thing was I want to give people opportunity. In addition to that, when I was an undergrad, I helped get students that had less than 2.0 GPAs in the four-year institutions. The reason why I said, like, you know, it doesn't change because that's kind of how I already am, if that makes sense. And my dad gave me those qualities to really try to make a difference, to give people opportunities, even if things aren't going right for you. That's the best way I can answer that question. It's a mindset. It doesn't, it isn't about how much you have. It's what you can give. 100%. Because again, I mean, life is always going to be difficult, but life, there's no reason. I, I don't, there's not a lot of reasons not to be kind. Everyone can have their bad days, but being kind is the more, more of a holistic thing. It goes past the moment. So living your life through, like trying to be kind as you can, I really think that's often a reward in itself. You mentioned that you, gave the commencement speech, and then you were sick. Talk about how you went from your undergrad to Harvard Law. So if you don't mind, I just need to like kind of like give kind of like context leading up to that. So, um, you know, I got into school at Bowie. I transferred during right before junior year. So I came into UMD, which is the University of Maryland, as a junior. So my first semester went great. And I became the president of the History Undergraduate Association. Things were just really working. However, my dad picked up a third job so I can go to Maryland. He had a stroke during my second semester at Maryland. So I had to come and make a decision and say, do I want to just stop going to school or and help my father? Or do I let the house just get foreclosed and keep going to school? So I just said, you know what, I'll just do both. And so literally, I would wake up every day around four o'clock go to work until like nine, maybe 10. Then from like 10 to 11, depending on the day, I would go to school from like 10 to 11 to four to five. Then I would go back to work to finish the day from like, depending on the day, I would go from like maybe five to nine or five to eight just to finish out my hours. And then I would go study. And I did all of that. And, you know, it, it was a lot, right? It was really trying. Uh, it was, I, it sucked to see my dad like that. Um, 
it just wasn't pretty, but it's everything worked out and I still became the commencement speaker. And that's why, you know, I think that's, I think that's the part of the story that kind of made my story go viral was the fact that, all right, he didn't just go to like, he just wasn't a sanitation worker, but he did it full time while going to school. However, that really broke me down. Like it really broke down probably every part of my body. Um, yeah. So saying that to say, I started feeling unwell like towards the end of 2018. And I couldn't really go to a doctor because I, because despite me having like health insurance through this, through the university, like the doctors I needed to see were still out of my price range despite having health insurance. So I ended up making a decision. I had a cousin, Dominic, you know, he told me, he was like, bro, I hate to say it. I mean, you know, I was about to lose my house to foreclosure. I'm sick anyway. He said, bro, you might as well. He said, I'm, he said, I'm sorry to say this, but you're going crazy just sitting here withering away. Maybe you should just like focus on a goal. And even if you have to move slowly, just, just go for it. And so that's what I did. I started studying for the LSAT. <laughs> and then uh, I ended and up. And why? Why the LSAT? Because you probably hadn't had tons of experience with lawyers. Well, the thing was, I told myself during like, you know, the end of junior year or maybe mid junior year, I wanted to go to law school. And I graduated in the winter semester. So pretty much I didn't have time to go straight through. So coincidentally, how with how the timing, you know, kind of ended up, there was time to study for the LSAT during the year I was, you know, that I got sick so I can get into the next cycle. And um, I felt horrible, by the way, I, just to give you a visual image, people don't, again, this, this part of the story got skipped over every single time. When I was studying, I was so sick. My cousin had to sit behind me like with a cold rag and put it on my neck while I'm studying to keep me focused so I could ignore the nausea. And I'm studying, you know, doing my problems and throwing up at the same time in this other bucket next to me. But the reason why he did that was because he knew I was going insane because I felt so guilty. I was like, all right, martial arts and boxing was my way out of poverty back in the day I got injured. You know, I do all this work. I'm the commencement speaker. I'm supposed to get a job now, right, in theory, so I can help provide for my dad. And now that gets taken away, too. And I'm like, you know... Like, I felt so guilty because my we, we did all of these sacrifices and, you know, every time I got so close, it gets taken away. So he literally did everything in his power to keep me sane during the time of studying for the LSAT, despite because, again, I was nauseated 24 hours a day. And I'm not exaggerating. I would wake up, be nauseated, go to sleep, be nauseated, wake up. And it doesn't ever change. So saying all that to say law school was the goal in undergrad. So that just made sense for me to be the goal to focus on. And I don't know how it happened, but it worked out. It worked out. Because you did the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Robert Bog Group. It was a company. Um, so fun fact, the only reason why I didn't lose my house. And by the way, we were really, really close to losing this house, like days, just days away. And I went into a Starbucks and this lady said something really nice to the barista. And I went up to the lady and I said, wow, that was a really kind thing to say. I didn't tell her I was sick, but I told her, um, you know, I'm just really grateful by the way you treat people. And uh, I don't know if anyone, I told her, I don't know if anyone has ever told you that, but I just want to make sure I tell you that because you made my day just by being in your presence when you did that. And literally like three days later, I get a, I get a job offer for being a consultant in DC, like a management consultant in DC, despite me being very sick and they didn't care. They just worked with me. And I ended up getting a mentor there. And that was at college. You met him at college. No, this was while I was sick after graduation. Got it. So, so this is so just to rehash, like I graduate at the end of 2018. I get super sick at the beginning of 19. Through mid 19, I started studying for the LSAT. And towards like the end of the middle of 2019, I walk into a Starbucks, meet this lady. And then I get this random job offer from the Robert Bob group just because I complimented her and what she did. And she got to know me and they knew I was sick, but they decided to still work with me despite that because they didn't care because they thought I had a lot of grit and a lot of other things. So did this woman work at that company? She worked for KPMG. And, and she, so you give her a compliment because I think this is so important. You go out of your way to give someone a compliment expecting nothing. You're not looking for anything in return except to help her and make her have a good day. Yep, you give her a compliment. Good. 
she talks with you, engages with you, learns some things about you, invests in you as a human being, and then makes some phone calls so that you can get a job? 100%. And again, it was like, it was like my first, like, true, like, it was like a true career job. Like, you know, it was like, oh, wow, I'm not getting paid hourly. This is a salary. No like, roaches. Wow. No roaches. And like, my job there was to help implement the new tax system into the, to Washington, D.C. And again, but the biggest thing I took away from the job was I got a mentor. His name is Patrick Bob. And Patrick is the one who really helped me kind of work through my, my illness at the time. Because so he went to MIT, Georgetown. He's a very smart guy. And like, he's really into athletics. And so like when I would be up at like 4 a.m. studying for the LSAT, like I would send him videos of me studying. And then he would send me videos of him back. Like, like you know, like because he would do like early morning runs. And he was like, well, he said like, oh, yeah, you think you're tough for doing the LSAT? I'm running, you know. So we, it was like a little game we used to play. And then like even with him specifically, he literally like, helped me just save my home, like out of his own pocket. And literally that moment at the Starbucks changed my life. And that's the only reason I was able to even get to Harvard, because at that point I had the resources to actually focus on the test full time. And your health got better. And the thing about the health problem was it just stopped getting worse. I actually didn't start dealing with the health component until earlier this year, like after I got to Harvard. So like, even when I was going through that whole media storm, like, again, I wasn't well, I, I mean, again, I never talked about it. I didn't, I, I told people briefly that I got sick in 2019, but it didn't take an Einstein to realize that wasn't the part of the story that they were focused on or even interested in. So, you know, I just didn't really talk about it. So you have some people come around you, which I just love to how you know, it's a sanitation worker is encouraging you. And then it's the woman at Starbucks. And then it's the mentor because it takes a community of people. 100%. I think to kind of just speak to something broader for a second. Absolutely. Kind of like moving through like different socioeconomic classes. Is that's a very hard thing to do just to move through each class because again, on one minute, like on one and all right. Well, I, let's say I go to a kid who's uh at the bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum. I say, go do good in school. Well, it's not about necessarily just doing good in school, but it's like, well, how are you surviving when you're not in school? You know, like, what is your home life like? Like, like what are you witnessing? Um, are you hungry? So it's hard to do that. Uh, then let's say this, uh, a kid who comes from that side of the spectrum, if you get sick, can you go to a doctor? I don't even think I even told you this. In 10th grade, I almost... <laughs> You know, me and my dad didn't know, know a lot about the medical system, but I got I got sick a lot in 10th grade and I almost had to like stay back because I didn't have a doctor's note for how much I got sick. But the thing is, I didn't have health insurance, so I couldn't go to the doctor because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> so and we couldn't afford that out of pocket thing. And I remember one time I went to um, went into the office with my excuse note from my dad saying, you know, my son wasn't well. She said, you know, you're lying. You wouldn't miss this much school if you were sick, because if you were sick, you'd have a doctor's note. But I'm like, I can't go to the doctor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, was like, I can't go. And so it's, it's really weird. When we talk about and and by we, I mean, the society, the conversations that have been happening in the last, I, I would say more so in the last couple of years about systemic problems with systems and biases and all of those kinds of conversations, oftentimes around race. Also, when it comes to socioeconomic status, because there are people in privileged roles who can't even imagine and never even went to a place of, well, what if he can't afford a doctor? Mm -hmm. And then to me, you'd hope that people then would say, how can we get him to a doctor? Because there are organizations and there are places that could help you, but your dad didn't have, he wasn't equipped to, to deal with that, navigating that system. And so to, in my, I, I'm going to get on a soapbox for just one second. Well, come on school, like help this kid, someone help him navigate this and, and get him in touch with organizations because everybody needs an advocate and not everyone has systems and information around them who can advocate for themselves and children that is, should not be their role. So I'm stepping, I'm stepping down. And, you know, and just to say that, to say like, for example, like there's the former Solicitor General, right? His name was uh, Neil Kotschow. He was under, he's like one of the, probably the more famous attorneys in the nation at the moment. 
you know, when my story broke, he ended up, you know, reaching out to me, you know, via Twitter, which was pretty interesting. Cause I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't know who he was at the time because again, I, I was just getting into the legal world, but come to find out he's one of the biggest deals in the entire legal community. But, you know, even with him, like, you know, I met him, he was very kind, very kind to me. And he started like giving me access to doctors started. Uh, and I, I, t- I literally told him, Hey, this is what's wrong. I'm about to start school, but I have a problem. I'm like, I'm not well. And I guess for me, it's like, I was always pushing to, cause I, my mind basically said, all right, just get through this. You're one step out of poverty. Get through this. You're another step out of poverty. Um, so again, I would have went through law school like um, with you know no health resources if that's what it was going to come to. But you know, thanks to somebody like him, he was able to help me kind of figure things out. You know, one his wife was a doctor, and he was able to again. Long story short, he helped me get the resources that I needed to kind of help myself uh, better my situation. And I would, and that was just by pure luck, right? So. Again, on one end, it's hard work, but there's no reason someone should look at my story and say, oh, that's what hard work gets you. It's like hard work plus a lot of luck and fortunate circumstances. And attitude. And attitude. I mean, that's fair too. But I guess I just always try to like focus on my hard work would have never meant anything if I didn't meet these random people who just happened to want to invest into me. Because people work hard all the time, like my dad, but all I got him was a stroke. And no support when he had his stroke. And that's why I had to work full time as a sanitation worker anyway. So like I see poor people all the time with great attitudes towards working, but they just weren't lucky enough to catch a break. And I think that's sometimes why I get that whole phrase, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Like I just think that's like the biggest myth that one can say, because I have not met one person or read one story, whoever, who just did it completely by themselves. Never once. But everyone knew like that Tower Perry was paying my tuition, right? We didn't say that, did we? Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So long story short, um, then all of a sudden I get this call from Atlanta. I just assumed it was like Fox Atlanta because I saw Fox Atlanta post something on Facebook about me. But I was like, oh, no. Uh, I pick up the phone. He's like, hey. I was like, uh, hey, uh, this is Rahan. He said, yeah, um, this is Tyler Perry. And I was like, no, it's not. Like, you know, who is this? Uh, and then, then he did the Medea voice. And then he basically said, hey, I want to pay your tuition. And... And Harvard Law School, not that cheap. Nah, uh, I think it's like 68000 a year without room and board. So he's paying your tuition as long as you're in school. I mean, he did a year one. It, he, I guess here's the weird thing was he said, um, I was told it was just going to be for the first year, but then he just went and did the second year too. So like, and that just happened literally like maybe like a week ago. Like he paid my, and I didn't see it coming because I, like, I was, I gave them access to my account. So I was getting ready to pay, pay for it, right? Get my loans out. And then all of a sudden it says, you know, bill has been paid. Like, oh, wow. It just gives me chills because when people have whatever we have to give, to give. So the woman, the sanitation workers, all that they could give you was encouragement, right? They didn't have other things to give you. The woman at Starbucks, she could give you access to someone else. The gentleman who was your mentor, he gave you the ability to be connected to some people who could help you. Then by you going out and telling your story, Tyler Perry, who has a lot of resources financially and who has a mission on this earth to help other people and to lift people up, comes to you and says, your bill has been paid. That's incredible. Definitely. It was definitely the most humbling moment in my life because again, uh, again, things were going wrong. Uh, again, my dad got sick. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to like do school and take care of him. Then one day, uh, I just get this call and it's Tyler Perry and he says, Hey, I just, I'm proud of you. And, uh, I want to give you a break. So please allow me to do this for you. And he, he also told me like, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell people I'm doing this, you know, this is just between us. And if you want to mention it, that's on you, but between me and you, I'm not going to tell anyone. But I always pay homage to people who help me. So again, I'm not ashamed of admitting that I've had help because I honestly do believe it takes a village. And again, I'm not, I don't want to be a person who says I'm self-made. Nah, I am a person where people invested into me and I made good on that investment. Do you now feel like you have more responsibility to finish school, to do well, because you have other people like Tyler Perry who say, I believe in you. I'm going to pay this bill because I believe you're going to go do some amazing things and help other people. Yeah, definitely. I'll say um, it just reaffirmed what was already there. It's like, you know, look, 
you have to finish the mission, get the job done, try to be kind while doing it and just pay it forward. And I think, again, that's the message my dad always told me. And again, it's always, I don't know, I feel that's just the cycle. And so, yes, see, your question is, it just reaffirms it. You have a bunch of people who come alongside of you and help you. And then you take the opportunity that they give you and you take full advantage of that opportunity. You go, you get accepted to Harvard Law and you find a way to become, you're well, correct? No? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm on my, I'm on a healing journey. Let's say that. I'm okay. still- you're on the path. You're on the yeah. path to wellness and you have access to resources and physicians who are helping you navigate that. So when you're sitting around talking to your classmates, do you ever talk about, you know, what would you get on your SAT? I mean, you, no one else there could have the same score that you had, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, well, I, I don't think those conversations happen, right? Because there's like this unwilling rule anyway. Like, it's kind of like once you get here, we don't talk about the st- test scores about anything, right? So, like, it's just a question that just doesn't come up. But, yeah, I, I, I guess that's all I can say to that. Like, so some, I'm not going to lie, nothing like that has ever come up. It'd be a fun party game, though. You could we'll win be- that party game all day long. <laughs> Let's guess our scores. Like, you win all day. So when you graduate, what do you want to do? Well, I'm still trying to find out like at the moment, right? Because again, there's a lot to consider, you know, I'm not healed completely yet. I don't know what my body can take. Cause again, working at a big law firm, for example, they pay the, they pay a great amount of money, but that's a lot of uh, work and I'm not afraid of work, but now it's more so about like, how do I stay healthy and not get worse? Quite frankly, there's just a lot to consider. I do want to become a teacher at some point, um, a high school teacher. Uh, I just have to figure out how I'm going to get there. Just saying that to say, um, I have a lot to figure out and uh, I have about two years to figure it out. And I suspect based on all the things that you've talked about, there are people around helping you and because it isn't, I mean, no part of anyone's journey is something to navigate alone. What do you say to those, you know, sanitation workers who've seen you on, you know, Today Show and Washington Post and all the and viral videos, all the places you've been? What's your message for them? Well, one, I want to always, well, one, I just always tell them, I'm sorry that not a lot of people see you. <laughs> That's one. And two, thank you for all that you do. But then three, it's just kind of like, you know, I guess my message for everyone, but even specifically them, it's just like, you make life a better place. And uh, if you could do that holistically. I'm just always going to be grateful for that because you make our life livable. Great message. And how many times do we walk by people doing jobs like that and not see them or thank them or talk with them or engage with them? And I bet your entire life, no matter how successful, where your life takes you, you're going to pass a sanitation worker and be like, hey, good job. Thanks. God, definitely. And even if it's a, just a head nod, just some form of acknowledgement. You just look at the world and see things to be grateful for. And I love that about your story, the way that you tell it. And I, that's there are so many pieces of what you've said that I think apply to everybody's life and we can all learn something from you. But there's a lot of people who have had things pretty easy. You used the word spoiled before, who can't see things through the light of gratitude, who complain about it's raining or my flight was delayed or my coffee is too cold. These things that in the big picture are so minuscule and to look at the world and just keep eyes open for what am I grateful for? It just, it will change your life. It changed yours. Definitely. You know, like I said, sometimes it's kind of a sad thing because again, you know, I can't ask anybody to live an experience that they didn't live, right? You can only experience the lens that you have because it's your life. But I do think poor, not poor, um, sick or not sick. I think one of the greatest gifts that my dad really kind of uh, instilled in me was just the reality is just sometimes just step out of your own body and try to be objective. Like, you know, for example, um, yeah, we had a pretty rough growing up, but there were some people who didn't even have a home. There are some people who didn't have a father or a mother. So like, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean I can't feel bad, but sometimes it just reminds me that there's still something to be thankful for because it can always get worse. It can always get worse. A hundred percent. And so often I think people think about gratitude or being thankful, you know, Thanksgiving time. 
And then, you know, you go through the rest of life and it comes back to this one time of year. But to think it could always get worse and your attitude likely can always get better. Definitely. How is your family? We haven't talked about your brother. How's your brother? How's your dad? Oh, well, my brother's doing fine. Um, you know, that sanitation company, uh, you know, that we that we both work for, he now um, pretty much runs the Prince George's County Yard, which is the biggest yard of the entire company. So, you know, he's been moving his way up for the last couple of years, really just kind of mastering the sanitation world. And that's what he wants to do with his life. And uh, he's making a lot of it. And my dad, uh, again, dad's, like I said, it's more of like a bittersweet situation. You know, he's gotten a lot better since, you know, I was caregiving for him throughout all of 1L. He's been getting better. He's not where he wants to be. So, you know, it's a rough situation, but I can tell you this, he's really proud that uh, me and my brother are just really moving forward. And uh, he always tells us that that's the one thing he's grateful for. Uh, he was able to like, you know, be really proud of his kids. And you still have a long way to go. And so does your brother in Absolutely. whatever you're going to do in the world. I could talk to you all day, but I imagine that you're a busy guy and you probably have some things to do. So I'm going to ask the final question of the podcast, which is, is there a quote or song or scripture lyric, something that has motivated you through your journey? Well, every one time somebody used to ask me this question, I used to say this Muhammad Ali quote, it used to go like, I hated every minute of training, but I said, suffer now and live the rest of my life as a champion. That used to be like the quote I used to live by. I actually ended up changing it very recently. And it's just like two words, be kind. I just think if you're kind, a lot of things are going to work out in your favor, even when you don't mean it, you know, the work, I don't know. I think really the, I think being kind really kind of led my life or at least being kind to the best of my ability kind of gave me opportunities that really were just unimaginable. Thank you for sharing your story. Best of luck in your career, wherever that may take you. And there's just so many things that I think can be extrapolated from your story. And I, I'm really grateful that you shared some things that you haven't talked about before, because in understanding the complexity and the context of your story, we can pull out some of the nuances that will help other people. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So as we, as we close, I just look around who's invisible, who needs to be seen, who needs to be valued. And once you see them, how can you help them? My hope is this incredible story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, subscribe to the show, and share our episodes with your family and friends. Do you or someone you know have a story about flipping your script? We'd love to share it. Contact us on our website, flipyourscriptpodcast.com. To stay up to date on all things Flip Your Script, make sure to follow host Christy Peel on social media. You can also check out the website for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and other great episodes.